How would you like to know how it all began? And I, what I mean, how it might have all, all of us began. Yeah? Okay, I'm going to take you on a journey. This is life. This is a cell dividing. Watch the nucleus go bing, and the cell go bong. Isn't that cool? Let's see that again. Bong. That's what it's all about. <laughs> I'll tell you my personal journey, and then I hope you'll see how that it's all of our journeys. When I was a young kid in Canada, I would walk in sagebrush hills like this, and I loved it. I loved the hills. But I said, where did life start from? So I thought, how on earth do you solve this problem? And then I read about this guy. And this guy used to do thought experiments late at night where he's running alongside a beam of light. And that led to special relativity. So I said, I can do that. So this was my first thought experiment. And in my head was a molecular machine suddenly appeared out of nowhere or something. And I thought, what on earth? And then I got the message from this machine, figure out how I made a copy of myself. So I spent 20 years on the computer trying to figure it out. Then one day on a long flight to China, I'd done all the work, I put on my noise-canceling headphones and my eye patches, and I went into a three-and-a-half-hour molecular soup experiment, and I became these molecules, and they're just flowing and flowing thought experiments, you know? I was membranes, and the membranes were peeling off, and they were encapsulating other molecules, and they were dividing, and it was like... But this was just a thought experiment, just sketches in a notebook, until I met this man, Dave Deemer, who's a one-letter mutation from me. I don't know if it's a mutation in the right direction or the wrong direction, but... <laughs> Anyway, here he is in Kamchatka doing his origin of life research. He's one of the preeminent thinkers in the origin of life. He lived just down the road from me. So we formed this collaboration, the chemist and the sort of visionary, wacky computationalist. And he trained me. He gave me stacks of papers to read and books and things like that and conferences to go to. I loaded up my brain and then I closed my eyes about a year and a half ago and this is what came in. All the bubbles that I saw originally now were going in a cycle and I think, what is on earth is going on? Oh, they're getting more complex. Oh my God, I better rush, off, rush this off to Dave. And we turn it into science. And now it's published as the coupled phases model for the original life. I would say, perhaps, it's the first end-to-end -end model that takes you from individual little molecule solutes all the way to cell division. Pretty bold, huh? Needs to be tested. <laughs> now, let's do a thought experiment together. Let's fly back to the ancient Earth. This is our computer model of what land looked like four billion years ago, or almost four billion years ago. Volcanic islands in a huge ocean, no breathable oxygen, totally alien world, but it had geysers on it. Geysers like you see at Yellowstone. And what are they doing? They're pumping water on a regular basis like Old Faithful, and they're filling these ponds. And it turns out that, just like your bathtub at home, when it fills with warm water and goes down and you sit in it and whatnot, what happens around the bathtub? A ring forms. Now, the ring will form out of stuff like this, a piece of the Murray meteorite that fell 65 years ago on Kentucky, which has 70 amino acids on board. The building blocks of life from space. So all this stuff is in this soup, the, the primordial soup, some people call it, forming these bathtub rings. And Dave researched this for 20 years and realized these bathtub rings are chemical factories. They can make all kinds of molecules, the building blocks of life. Here's one under the microscope. Layers and layers and layers of something called lipids, which is basically, you know, uh, like soap bubbles, your coffee cream, things like that. But it's, it's in between those lipids, all kinds of molecules can form. Now take a look. This is what lipid looks like when water is added to it. it looks totally alive, doesn't it? Super cool. So here's our little model. Uh, we've got our dried lipid, just like a bathtub ring. Up comes our water, and trillions of containers come off. Now, notice when they're peeling off, they're picking up those red things, and those red things are polymers. They could be proteins or nucleic acids, all kinds of things. And now they're floating in the water, and the, those polymers are kind of like tools. They're kind of like random experiments. Like one bubble says, okay, I just popped. I lost all my contents. But the other one might say, hmm, this, this polymer that I'm containing is like stabilizing me. And, and guess what? When they're stabilized, they live longer 
and they may go back and dump their polymer back into the bathtub ring, and then it goes in a cycle over and over. It's called a pump or a kinetic trap for chemists. But it's a tools by chance thing. So there's a tools by chance factory, which is this, this bathtub ring, making all kinds of freaking molecular tools, most of which don't do anything. They're pretty fanciful. But sometimes it makes tools that are useful. Take a look. Let's take a look through the eye of the needle here. Well, here's a model for you. I hope you can understand it. Well, we won't say the word polymer again, I promise. <laughs> so say if that needle was a random tool, but it happened to stitch along the membrane and make the membrane stronger. You know, when you stitch you know, a, a patch and a hole in something, it makes it stronger, right? So that bubble lives, and it goes on and goes back, and it can pick up a second tool. So this is this magical cycle. Second tool might be a corkscrew kind of a thingy which makes a hole that allows things in and out. Very important function for life, right? Just a bubble with a hole in it. The next tool it picks up might be this magnifying glass kind of tool, which focuses energy on, on all the, the things now that are inside and makes reactions. It's called metabolism. Oh, how cool. Now you've got sophisticated little bubble cells. They're not life, but they're really getting sophisticated all at once. And they're sharing tools with each other in a massive kind of collaboration. And then one day, the best tool of all appears, the body of our little Swiss Army knife. What can it do? It can organize all these tools. It can code for them. This is the beginning of the genome. But it can also make a copy of itself, which then picks up its own tool set. Now we're at the very boundary. We're at the position where we can go to life. And the final tool that emerges, which has its role right now, is these scissors, which snips this bubble apart all on its own. This is the origin of life. These bubbles can go on. They've got their own tools. They can make copies of them, get stuff in and out, and off they go. We have the origin of life. Cool, huh? Just like that. <laughs> but why? Why do we care about all this stuff? Why do we care about going to space? And why do we care about looking back at our origins? Well, Carl Woese, the great evolutionary biologist, he gave us some really great wisdom, saying early life was much more collective, much more communal than it is today. It may have well been a massive endosymbiosis. The English for that is life may have arisen through cooperation at the chemical level, watching that system work. Everything was being shared. The entire system was one system. Stephen Hawking said, our only chance of long-term survival is to not remain inward-looking on planet Earth, but to spread out into space. If we want to continue beyond the next 100 years, our future is in space. Let's put these two things together. You remember this from this morning's talk? What is it? It's shepherd with its biosphere, with its garden inside. But what is it really? It's another Earth. Watch this trick. What we are doing is allowing the Earth to make another, just like the cell division. And we, we may be life's only shot. The, the sun is going to turn into a super red giant in five billion years and just totally destroy the planet. We may be the, and we have the tools, but we may be the tools to allow life to go forward into the cosmos. That is how important we may be, our purpose. So I would say our civilization is a symbiosis between all of humanity and all of life, and our future, our very future, lies in this most radical collaboration. Thank you. Thank you.